Today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Hedgel, and he gave me a little bio, I'm going to read it, okay? We, we all know he's the Assistant Professor of Technology Management here at SUNY Poly, and he teaches organizational change and innovation. His research interests encompass four broad areas, ethics and governance, change and design, distributed innovation and actor networks, and social enterprise. So we want to hear about all of those. <laughs> Recently, he collaborated with a colleague from Temple University to com complete an ethnographic study of innovation and sustainability artifacts produced by architects and an empirical pilot of the effects of design immersion and network engagement on entrepreneurial self efficacy. Thank you for writing that's, those words. I know, that, that's what this is today. That's what this is about today. That one. Please help yourself to coffee and bagels, don't t shirt, okay? Because we're very informal. He um, collaboratively initiated a community based action research project, Innovation Challenge in New York, which we're going to learn about during the fall of 2014. In June of 2014, he organized and conducted an ICNY planning conference with representatives from area schools, including Cornell University. And I added this, we're working on a smaller version of the Innovation Challenge to be held with your class in March, looking at the uses of our library. I'm so, working with the director of the library, the new director, to do that. You can speak. <laughs> I give you Professor Hedge. Thank you. How many came to ICNY were there? I think a lot of you were. So for those who weren't in a little bit, I'm going to tell you more about it. So thank you. And and this project really owes to many people, a lot of you in the room were. So just want to let you know that we I thank you for that. So today I've broken this into four components. The first one, I just want to talk to you about the research gap as, as I saw or as we saw it. The landscape kind of breakdown here, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And questions that were guiding our research. And then module two, I want to talk just briefly about some of the key phenomena coming out of the literature that we thought was important to address. And then talk about the method and the results. The exciting part, the results, right? What did we learn from this? And then wrap it up with some contributions and possible implications, and then just have a broad discussion. So that's kind of the idea. And in terms of what we did with ICNY, just at a very high level, we were trying to talk about the DIY movement. This particular iteration was about the DIY movement here in our REDC area. And it was about making change in the local <coughs> institutional fields, if you would. And we had schools, Hartwood College was involved, we had Cope Sony Cope Skill. Oneonta was involved, uh, the Temple University, James came up from Temple, and of course all of this was made possible by funding from our generous community foundation. Are they here? No, but that's okay. <laughs> we, because basically their $8,000 really enabled us to do the project. These little projects, like these two-day interventions, cost a lot of money, you know, so it was wonderful that they were able to kind of make it all possible, and that made the data collection possible, so therefore the research is possible to them. And of course, us, of course, we were all involved. And this particular paper is really a collaboration with myself and James Mustafellas from Temple University and Feroz as well, who's been handling all the data analysis. All this wonderful t testing you're going to see in a little bit is really due to Feroz. Um, we collected both quantitative data and qualitative data. The qualitative data is going to be a separate paper that I'm going to work on with Dr. Berardino. We're trying to sift out what are some of the other kinds of implications that maybe we didn't capture with the uh, quantitative data. So that's going to be a separate project. So module one, why this particular research? Why is this important? Well, let me read a quote to you about entrepreneurship. And I think it's a, it kind of says a lot. Despite decades of attention, entrepreneurship scholars are still at pains to explain precisely why rates of entrepreneurial activity differ across countries. And what it's kind of saying, if any of you have been in this arena, we don't fully understand all the predictive variables for entrepreneurship. We certainly understand some of them, but we don't see it fully. And if you go a little bit further, some others have said, well, the, the issue is that we academics at a deeper level and development practitioners and policymakers don't understand how to conceptualize innovation properly. We don't understand all the factors. So that's kind of what the biggest issue I see is that we don't fully understand it, so we need to do more work in this arena to understand what are some of those other mediating variables that might importantly predict entrepreneurial activity, if you will. And, of course, you would turn to the institutional literature and look at that. That's a good source, right? These are institutional field issues. 
And so the institutional literature, well, if you look at it now, the current state is that we don't fully understand change and innovation, especially the microprocesses. We know that it occurs, but we don't fully understand it. And we're working on that. At the Academy of Management, there's been a lot of discussion the last two years about doing more work on understanding the particular microprocesses of institutional change. Uh, there's, and as I said earlier, there's no adequate or robust explanation of entrepreneurial activity. We know some of the key components. In a moment, I'll talk about some of those key components. But there seems to be more to it. And also, the traditional economic view of things, um, there, that literature has, to some degree, overlooked the behavioral aspects. It's been preoccupied with what we know as traditional economic principles, and it's overlooked some of the behavioral decision-making aspects that go into it. And so we want to make sure we tap into that. Now, if you localize this and just look at the Utica community, you might say, well, why the Utica community? Why is this an interesting place to do a little, a little research? The Community Foundation tracks important statistics about our community, about our HOC, Herkimer and Oneida Counties. And they say, from the stats they've been tracking, that we've got some issues currently. <coughs> if you look at just stat one, 20% of adults in Herkimer and 22% in Oneida had a four-year degree or higher which is lower than the state figure of 32% and the national figure of 28%. So we may be experiencing a brain drain here or a failure to develop, right? I don't know which it is, right? But that somehow we seem to lack some of that, stat shows. If you look at the second one, our incomes here locally are pretty low, right? We're at 44,000 in Herkimer, 49 in Oneida, which is well below state and nation. And if you look at the number of jobs lost in the past few years, 13% in Herkimer, 6% in Oneida, compared to 1% from the state, right, during the comparable time period. I want to go through all of them, but it gives us evidence of saying that this would be an interesting place to do some experimenting, right, to try out some new ideas, see what would work. Um, and as a researcher, I always think it's important to lay bare your assumptions, right? That's what we kind of learn in school to do. And so number one assumption that I've had working with James and others is that we really need to think about this more systemically and stop looking at a few key silver bullets, and I'll talk about those silver bullets in a moment, but that we need to look at it as an entire system, an integrated system, and that's what we're attempting to do over the long haul. Number two is that we believe that novelty, which is essential for innovation and entrepreneurship, we believe novelty is really a function of both humans and technology networked together. Sometimes this is referred to as actor network theory of uh, Bruno Latour and uh, Michael Collins' work, and we're building upon that because we believe that is the proper lens in which to view this and to work. We think it's uh, problematic to look at only behavioral issues or only technological issues, but the two have to be looked at together because we humans are enabled by that, right? And so forth. And then uh, third is legal and political regimes. You know, the things that we do, tinkering with our laws and our incentives are good. They're helpful, but they're not everything, right? And we sometimes want to rely upon those, those issues, too, those institutional aspects too much. And then lastly is that we do think institutional change is possible, but we think it's possible through discursive practices. And I'll talk more in a moment about this area of discursive practices. So that leads us up to the research uh, questions that were guiding us initially as we went into this. So number one was, which institutional strategies might governments, educators, and citizens deploy to encourage creative and entrepreneurial behavior in adolescents and or young adults? <coughs> yeah, that's our focal group. And then two was, how do we keep our best and brightest from this phenomenon of out-migration? And in a moment, I'll talk more about that and some of the literature on that. But that seems to be an issue. If you go back to that stat one, right, we don't seem to be able to keep our people or develop them. But I think it's a keeping issue. It's an out-migration issue. So module two, what does the relevant literature tell us? Well, if you look at institutional change, um, but, and most of you know that institutions, this has been a bit of a debate, because institutions arise essentially to provide stability makes social life stable. That is the core essence of institutions, essentially. And we call it institutional logics, right? The kind of the rules that institutions kind of give for us in terms of behavior. But we also know that institutions have to shift and change over time because those rules and those logics become a little outdated and not relevant, right? So that as much as we need to provide stability, we have to be able to shift the frame for stability. So that's where the rub's been, you know? 
And it seems like discursive practices is a promising area. This is kind of a newer area of institutionalism and institutional thought. And if you look at institutional uh, discursive change, the people that are working in this research area, Peters and others, they say that there are three flavors. They don't fully understand all the mechanisms or the microprocesses yet. And that's a little bit what we're going to try to provide some information on. But they say there are coordinate discourses, and those are really discourses that happen within the focal organizations that lead the institution. So, you know, us today gathering, I think, is a coordinate discourse. We're at a focal group within the academic institutional field for this area, right? In fact, we're the lead academic institution for this region, as I understand it. Two is communicative discourses are really what we do when we go out into the community and start to talk with those other people, all the community-based people that are not necessarily members of the focal groups within the uh, institutional fields. And then lastly is appreciative discourses, and that's where we go one step further and we sift through the community and try to find the bright spots. And the bright spots are really those areas in which there's positive behaviors that are, that are demonstrating how things can be better, that we can find these spots where there are improvements and so forth. Now, if you think about the ICNY experience that we had, we really focused in on those, those two types of discourses, communicative and the appreciative. Those were the core of what we did with that, with that experience or that treatment. And I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. Next is entrepreneurship. Of course, we've got to look at this literature. And um, there's been a lot of discussion in the last 15 years around the triple helix. Does anybody, do we know what the triple helix is? I know it may not, it, it, this term may be a little, a little tough one, but the, the research on triple helix has really been about how can government, industry, and education work together and form pipelines that then create new ideas and then get them out into ventures. And I think we're seeing the triple helix kind of play out here with Quad C. I think that's part of the motivation with Quad C. I don't know if I fully understand all the motivation, but I think that is legitimately part of it. But the problem with the reliance on the triple, uh, the triple helix is that it's only infrastructure. And we also know from a lot of research that infrastructure alone doesn't make entrepreneurs. You know, I can teach you how to do a business plan, but that doesn't mean you're going to go out and become an entrepreneur, does it? I think anybody who's taught, those are useful tools, but it doesn't make you want to be an entrepreneur, right? So as much as the triple helix is important, we know there's other issues at play here. And we know a lot of them are behavioral at the individual level, we know that self-efficacy, a lot of research says that various forms of self-efficacy are important, as well as mental rotations ability. And if you look at um, self-efficacy, the two types that seem to be most important for entrepreneurial activity is what we call collaborative self-efficacy, which is really confidence in one's ability to collaborate with others on whatever topic you choose, right? Just your ability to collaborate with others. And the second one that's really the most important for entrepreneurship in terms of literature is the work that McGee's done. They've done a lot of work on this. Is what we call entrepreneurial self-efficacy. And this is just really, as they say, your belief in your ability to successfully launch an entrepreneurial venture. So this is different than general self-efficacy, but certainly it's a subset of general self-efficacy for the people that are behaviorless in the audience who we we'll look at general self-efficacy. This is kind of a flavor of it, but it's an important flavor. So there's a distinction to be made between the two. And the last point that's really important is the mental rotations ability. And this is the visio-spatial intelligence. This is one's ability to envision things three-dimensionally in their mind and rotate and examine, right? And we know in the STEM literature, this is actually what got for us and I started on this journey of collaborating, was we both started to talk about this one day, and we found out that we both had an interest in it. His was coming from the STEM direction. As you know, in STEM, there's a lot of research linking the ability to do mental rotations to success as an engineer and so forth, but also an entrepreneur in this literature now we're seeing a connection too. That if you don't have that ability, you may not be able to be a good entrepreneur, or you may not want to be an entrepreneur, right? So we see a relationship there. And uh, next one is design culture. This body of literature, and this is really my area, my core focal area right now, design culture, which for a while was called design thinking. It still is referred to design, as design thinking, 
But I've been working at reconceptualizing it because it's more than just cognition. And I think it's been a bit of a stumbling block for the research in this area that we've been preoccupied with thinking of it as thinking or cognition only. And I've tried to reconceptualize it, I think, more broadly as culture and look at all the aspects that then relate to a culture. This is really a culture of designers or design thinking culture, right? So it's design culture. And under that, you'll see that I have two, two, area, two variables or two phenomena that I think are very important. One is network engagement. The other one is design immersion. Now, if you look, and, and this is really the heart. These two variables were, at, variables were at the heart of the ICNY experience or the treatment that we gave the students. Right? These were at the heart. So let me explain these two. The first one, network engagement, just really means to place a human actor into a network of technology so they can play and tinker and develop themselves. So an application of it might be a makerspace, right? That might be a realization. This is something where Daryl and I have been a little bit collaborating as well. Daryl was, of course, very important for this ICMY treatment. Um, the second one is design immersion, and that's exposure to the various aspects of the culture of designers, right? And one of the key issues that we see in terms of values, so cultural systems have values, right? One of the key values of designers is really a melding of scientific rigor with aesthetic sensibilities together, right? Um, placing a big emphasis on stakeholder experience, not just self-return, right? So there are some differences in this cultural system of designers from, say, mainstream culture or other cultures. And design immersion means to, to expose others to that. Abductive reasoning is very important in design culture. Abductive reasoning is trial and error reasoning, which differs from inductive and deductive, right? And it moves us from strict analysis into experimentation. That's how we actually shift in the brain to experimentation, is to go through an abductive, abductive reasoning shift, if you will. So we know that designers uh, value that. And also visualization techniques which of course helps with mental rotations, all kinds of visualization techniques, of drawing, uh, prototyping, building models. Deb and I were just chatting about that a moment ago, right? So, and this, now a lot of this, I had already worked up a background theory on this topic, and I presented it at the Academy of Management in 2014, in August of 2014. This is the paper, but in that paper I talked about these various variables and how I believe they were important and, and gave a kind of a nice literature review that supported that theory. Now, since then, my idea is to go out and try to test different components of this, because it's a big theory. So that's kind of the broad idea here, that ICNY gave us an opportunity to test pieces of this bigger theory. Yeah, that's kind of the basic notion. And the last important part of the literature is that on out-migration or, or the brain drain, right, the brain drain. This is one that I think all of us are going to find very interesting because it's a recent break, kind of breakthrough research on it. For a long period of time, the fundamental theory about out-migration was who was responsible for out-migration from lesser populated areas to the, the dense top 10 areas of the country? Who do you think was, a, was held as a being accountable for that somehow? Any guesses? Nobody? Educators. We educators were responsible. We were teaching people to be a little too bright and to go to the better places. That was the theory. It wasn't tested but a lot, and that was becoming kind of a common wisdom for a period of time without migration, that we, either the high school teachers, were telling them, hey, you know, you're really bright, you ought to go to Harvard, or go to Boston, or go to name a top city, go to Palo Alto, right? right? Or go to New York City, you ought not to stay here. That was the theory anyway, right? And it kind of, you know, seems intuitively like, yeah, this could be correct. Guess what? Empirical research done just this past year, 2014, by Petron and friends says that, you know what, that's not it. And this is me read your quote. To the contrary, so not educators, to the contrary, our data suggests that the highest achieving rural students are among those with the greatest community attachments. So they really were attached to their communities. And that students' perceptions of local economic conditions, this is the rub, guys, Students' perceptions of local was the key deciding factor. If I don't think there's much opportunity there, I'm leaving. I love my home, I love my friends, it's not a bad place, but guess what? I gotta go someplace else. So that seems to be the key. Seems to be the key. So um, that told us with this project that if we're worried about out migration, then something we ought to be concerned about is yeah, the affect towards our local region. That might be a variable to be considered. 
How about perceptions of opportunity in our local community? That relates directly to this idea of local economic conditions and perception of it, right? If I don't think I'm going to be able to get a job, here you are, I'm likely to move on. And the last one was then getting some sense of their propensity to remain, right? How likely are you to stay here in the community? So, if I come back to my big conceptual framework that I proposed at the Academy of Management in 2014, this is what it looked like. And it started with this idea down here that we have these, what some of us call national systems, infrastructure, at a kind of larger governmental level. And the triple helix has been this model that everyone's done for a long time and said, if you just do this, everything else will work. Well, the truth was, when you actually analyze it, that wasn't true. People were doing that, and that alone didn't seem to work. So it wasn't the silver bullet that it was promised to be. So I said, why don't we look at other issues? Aren't there some human factors we ought to look at? Should we look at the cognitive development of individuals? Might that have something to do with this? If we know that objective reasoning is important for mental work, you know? Developmental issues, how does the, and this is not really my expertise in this area, but I've worked with somebody who actually has some expertise in that area to help me to say that there might be some background developmental issues that are important if you want people to be creative, novelty generating. And then also, what was my area is just what I call technological systems. And I said, should we, ought we not to look at how humans and technology interact in networks and how that might have some implications, you know, in terms of their ability or desires to be entrepreneurs? So what we did for this project was to take this box and work on this box. Not these others, right, but this box, this component of the bigger theory. So I'm working on, so you take that component and that's what I see in white as a treatment was. It was that component as an experiment. So collaborative design processes, network engagement, and design immersion. And then from that, we predicted some outcomes, right? So these are our hypotheses. And then we collected the data, of course, to prove it. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, the data. But let's talk about the hypotheses. The first one was that, that exposure to, the, this, to this treatment, I see in white as a treatment, would favorably uh, mediate in terms of their collaborative self-efficacy. Uh, we'd seen improvement, significant improvement there. That was the first hypothesis. The second one was that it would have a favorable impact on entrepreneurial self-efficacy. The third one was that their affect geopolitically, about the geopolitical region, about the local region, would be favorably influenced. The fourth one was that they would have a heightened sense of perceptions of opportunity. Which is, you know, if you go back to the out-migration literature, that seems to be an important factor if you want to keep your best and brightest here. And the last one was their propensity to remain would be favorably influenced. So these were the five propositions we were essentially working with. So for us, does the data now make sense? <laughs> Poor for us, was just doing the data analysis, not knowing the framework behind it, because we were in such a, such a rush, right? To get it all analyzed. So, and if you look at the top two, these speak to capabilities, right? That somehow they're at the heart of driving capability. And the last three are about engagement, getting them locally engaged, caring, and staying engaged with the local community. So capability engagement. Now, we didn't test this link, that these then become predictors for this, but a lot of the other literature, just as I just went through, kind of says that, yeah, if you have self-efficacy, you're probably more likely to be an entrepreneur, right? If you have this type of self-efficacy. If you perceive opportunity behind your community, you're more likely to stay and do something about that. Do you get that? So we didn't test that. That would take a, a longer kind of, it would take a longitudinal study, basically, I think, to effectively test that. So we're only looking at these hypotheses with our data. Now, let's talk about the method, if you will method and results. So this was our method. We had an exposure group that received the treatment. We had a control group that did not receive the treatment. And we did pre-exposure surveys, quantitative surveys as I mentioned a moment ago, and post-exposure surveys to see if the treatment had any impact on them. That was the basic idea. And we used a t-test approach, and, and, uh, and as I said, that for us, that worked on that for us. We had a 20, uh, an instrument that had 23 quantitative items. We had qualitative items as well, which I mentioned earlier, earlier Professor Berardino and I are going to work on that qualitative data as a separate paper and project, so we can make sense of that. And of course, the independent variable here would be our design culture treatment, ICNY as a process. And I'll talk more about this in a moment so you know 
what, what we did with that for those who weren't involved with it. And of course, these are the dependent variables which I just kind of ran through quickly with the hypotheses, right? So this was our uh, method. And uh, for, uh, for those who weren't there or don't remember what we did, we actually, the I ICMY experience, or so the treatment was in two components. Day one was immersion. And that's where we exposed them to the idea of DIYers in our community. We had them meet with experts, the students that were the participants, the students. They were able to ask questions of those experts. And then we took them on tours into the community so they could see makers in action. And we had a variety of making stops. We had some that were more kind of making for the sake of making for themselves, some that were more arts focused, some that were really truly entrepreneurs who were making money from this and had actually started small businesses. So there were a range of experiences we gave them. And then day two was the ideation day. This is really the heart of the experience. This is where we walked them through this process of getting them to come together in groups and then ideate. They generated ideas, how to make more of the DIY movement in the Utica area, and then we evaluated them, judged them, and we had a couple winning teams, three winning teams. In fact, Daryl, you were heading up the judging group, I believe, or helping to herd the judges. Is that correct? Yeah. So that was the basic exposure of what we did, and I, I'm not going to go through the details of the actual process of the ideation, but if anybody wants to learn more about that, I, I can talk to you about that. But what I would like to do is show you a video, a three and a half minute video, of some of the student experience during that day. So you get a better sense of what they actually did. And again, if you weren't there. So let me see if this works. Thank you. 
So I just wanted to have that so you'd have a little flavor if you weren't able to attend. And let's see, now it should move on. Yes. So in going into this, by the way, too, I want to just give you a little bit of background information. James Mustafellos at Temple has been doing design challenge, essentially the same process, for a few years earlier. And we had taken some students down in the spring. The provost had given us a little bit of fun to take some students as a trial down to that. And we had some antidotal evidence to suggest that you know, we were onto something. You know, there was some, but we wanted to test it to make sure we really were onto something interesting. And the anecdotal evidence was that they were engaged. Certainly, they got engaged and felt like they were more capable of being engaged after after experiencing design challenge. Passion. We saw students become very passionate about topics and about issues, and more and more likely to become engaged because of that. We think collaborative. We definitely had evidence that they felt much because if you talk to the students going into it, a lot of them had anxiety about working with people on teams, and these were teams where you don't know the other people in advance. We assign you that morning to the team, and if you're coming from different schools, there's really no chance. I mean, sometimes you do know somebody else, but most of the time you don't. And so a lot of them had apprehension and, and, and anxiety about that, which you know we kind of take for granted, but for them it was a big issue, and we'd heard them commenting, and then afterwards, they were like best friends after the process, right? And of course, they were hanging out, and so we could see they felt more, uh, more confident in collaboration, and more confident overall. We can just sense a greater, greater sense of confidence. Let me share with you now, in addition to the, te to the testing of the variables that I just discussed, the, the, the five hypotheses, we actually collected some descriptive data as well at the end, you know, for the second, for the post survey. And I thought this was kind of interesting. We asked students, would you recommend to your friends and colleagues that they participate in future iterations of the innovation challenge? 94% said yes. So we thought that was pretty good. They must have gotten something good. Because it's a big commitment. You know, for students, a whole day Saturday for our students is like, you know, like eternity, right? I, and so for them to say, yeah, you know, it was an all-day Friday as well. Friday, you might expect more of a Saturday, giving up a Saturday. So we thought that was a good indicator. And when asked, how much have you been personally transformed by participation in the Innovation Challenge, 56% said much or very much, right? So we thought, you know, it wasn't 100%, I'd like to see it be 100, but I thought that was pretty significant as well. Pretty interesting, let's put it that way. Pretty interesting for descriptive data. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the results. You know, this, we're going to look only at the exposure group, pre and post, the t-test. The little caveat about this kind of work, um, what we found was that almost, I think every single variable showed positive mediation, which meant that the post group, the scores were higher unlike the control group, so that was even more reinforcing there, right? But, so, so we saw positive mediation along every dimension, except though, not all of that mediation could be attributable to the treatment. Some of it was not significant, the significance was in favor of chance. That's kind of, for those who've done t-test, you know, that's how that works, right? So what I've done is I've taken the variables, and I'll show them in a moment, I've taken that data that Frost generated, and I've color-coded it, you know, the red is the stuff where, where we can't, attributed to the treatment. The green is where we pretty convinced that it's attributable to the treatment. Is that cool? Just want to make sure that we understand that. So let's look at H1 and H2, which is really about their capabilities, right? Developing their capabilities. Look at that data. And what we saw was collaborative self-efficacy. On, on the first four dimensions, we, did, we could not, there was a difference, but we cannot attribute that positive mediation to the treatment. But the last dimension, we could, and this was the most interesting dimension, actually, and this, this one relates to how much confidence do you have in your ability to collaboratively generate highly creative, novel, and useful ideas. So they felt, I mean, that, that seems clearly attributable to the treatment. So I thought that was interesting. Entrepreneurial self-efficacy, almost all the, the overall, the overall figure was significantly attributable to the treatment and most of the dimensions. So we thought that was very reassuring. So we did seem to move the needle here. Uh, H3, 4, and 5, and this kind of relates to the engagement locally. Are you likely to stay or remain engaged locally? The sad news for me was that was affect geopolitical, which really relates to do they, do they feel more favorably about our local area. We, while they did, it did improve not enough to overcome chance, so that it's not attributable to the treatment. So I was a little bit disappointed about that. I thought after all that work and showing them the best of Utica, you know, that 
they feel better about Utica, but not significantly so. But, but what's more important for our migration is the perception of opportunity. Look at that. Significant at the highest level on most of the dimensions. The only dimension that wasn't significantly attributable to the treatment was happiness, opportunity for happiness in the local community. So, go figure. But the dimension of personal fulfillment and employment opportunity, they felt more favorable about that. And again, significantly attributable to the treatment. And the last one is propensity to remain. And sadly, they were not more likely to remain, at least attributable to the treatment. But one of the dimensions was interesting, because that one was attributable. How likely are you to remain in your current local community? So that's the key question. And they say, yeah. And I'm more likely to do it, actually. So we thought that was interesting. So if I am to summarize this, I would say that collaborative self-efficacy, we had somewhat of an impact. It's kind of partially supported. Uh, entrepreneurial self-efficacy, I think it's pretty much fully supported. Of affect geopolitically not supported, unfortunately, you know. Uh, H4, perceptions of opportunity, pretty pretty darn clear that it was supported. And the last one, propensity to remain partially supported, at least one important dimension was supported. So that's kind of what I think the results tell us. And of course, I believe that if we had repeat, you know, if you think about a drug trial, you know, with drug, if you're taking penicillin for something, you need to take penicillin more than once, right? So, yeah, right, typically, what's the doctor say? I'm not a health person, what they say, one or two weeks of the doses, right? And then you're cured. So maybe more repeat exposures would help with some of these dimensions as well, you know? Uh, what are the implications? Well, contributions, I think it gives us some evidence for portions of this broader view of what, uh, what may predict entrepreneurship. I think it gives us some more evidence for that, to fill in the blanks of my theory, if you will. Five hypotheses, and I think it's, they're important because there was a lot of positive evidence there. Not fully, but a lot. And lastly, I do think this gives credence to the reconceptualization of design thinking and design culture, because I think it really is that. And we're now, I think these variables are kind of showing that. So I think that's the contributions potential of this paper. And in terms of cautions, there's always some cautions, right? Um, it's interdisciplinary and it's broad and challenging, you know, which makes it fun from my perspective, but it makes it more difficult. Um, this is only a pilot study. It's small. Our end was uh, 41 for the, uh, for the um, exposure group and 34 for the control group. So it's a small study. So I wouldn't want to try to generalize this yet, of course, right? And, and again, these effects. So we do see the effects after, you know, the ones that we just talked about, they're there. But if I go back and test them again in five months, are they going to be there? So I don't know how sustainable these effects are, especially if we're not giving them additional treatments, right? So that's pretty much it. Usefulness, uh, yeah, policymakers. I think it's interesting to talk about this stuff. So locally, our local policymakers, I would love them to be a part of this discussion, you know, and because maybe they can start to do things too. It just doesn't have to be us, right, doing these kind of treatments. Others, and I know, Catherine, we do a lot of community-based work, so others can do, right? Other groups can get involved. So I think policymakers, it can stimulate the kind of conversations about how can we make the community stronger. And us as educators, I think this is interesting to talk about what can we do besides the traditional classroom experience, you know? And I think that's it for the moment, guys.